The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plen Air Magazine. Today we have the incomparable Tony Pro. He's going to teach you expressive portrait secrets. Enjoy. Hi everyone, welcome to my uh, DVD on loosening up uh, the expressive portrait. Uh, I'm going to share with you today some ideas on uh, painting the portrait in an expressive manner, getting the essence of the portrait, loosening up. You know, a lot of times when we when we're painting from life, or you know, this particular example is going to be from a photo, but it was from a life session that I had many years ago. Uh, a lot of times. Um, we want to get in and just kind of loosen up and experiment when we're in front of the model. You know, sometimes the the um, the dullness of of going in and just being as you know as academic as we possibly can uh, that can get old. You know, and sometimes we want to have fun. Sometimes we want to show off. So the idea is to actually get in, and we want to um, you know be be religious about having a good uh, foundational drawing. But then once we get that drawing and that structure, we can kind of start having fun and start pushing color and uh, you know, getting an exciting uh, feel to a painting, getting the, the essence of the painting, the spirit of the painting. And you know, a lot of times we don't want to have to worry about likeness as much. We'd rather get a prettier painting or more exciting visual painting and, and push, uh, you know, push the, the femininity of a, a female model or the masculinity of a male model, or push the character of an older model. Uh, so today what we're going to be doing is uh, we're going to be painting uh, two paintings. We're going to do one painting of a young lady, and then we're also going to do a, a painting of a, an old character uh, male study with a, a you know, kind of a big red beard and that kind of thing. So we're going to have some fun with this, and I invite you to come along and uh, Let's, uh, let's see if we can get something exciting for you. So I'm just going to cover uh, my materials and my paint and all the uh, tools that I'm going to be using today for this uh, demonstration. We'll start with the paint that I'm using. Uh, almost all the paint here, with the exception of these two colors, are all Michael Harding uh, Artist Oil Colors. Uh, these, these are uh, handmade paints um, out of uh, uh, Wales in England, and or I should say in the UK. And uh, starting from this upper corner up here, uh, all the way over at the end here, we have uh, cadmium yellow medium. I have two whites. The really large glob here is Kremnitz white. Uh, and the smaller glob here is titanium white two. Uh, this is titanium white uh, with a uh, little bit of zinc oxide in it, and it's uh, made with, uh, it's ground in linseed oil. The Kremnitz white I use, uh, the reason I have two whites here is the, the Kremnitz white is not a, a powerful, uh, it's not a powerful white. It just adds a lot of thickness, a lot of character to the paint. And when you're doing expressive portraiture, when you're doing uh, you know, paintings that you want a lot of thick, juicy paint, um, but you don't want to overpower or, or um, tint strength too much, you use a Kremnitz white. The titanium white has a much stronger tinting strength, 
So a little goes a longer way than the Kremnitz white. So that's why I have the two. Um, here we have yellow ochre deep, which is this color here. Uh, I like to use this because it's a much warmer uh, yellow than your, your typical yellow ochre. And here we have cadmium orange. Here we have cadmium red light. Here we have alizarin crimson. Uh, there's also a variation on this that Michael makes called alizarin claret, which is the, uh, a little bit more permanent version of alizarin crimson. Um, here we have transparent oxide red. And these two colors are a couple of interesting colors um, that I call convenience colors. Uh, and the reason I use them is I can, I can actually mix these from this palette that I have here, but I use them as a time-saving tool. Uh, and these are made, um, they're actually these grays that I've been using for my friends over uh, at Jerry's Artorama. They started making these um, colors called 12 Shades of Gray. And this particular one is, this is warm gray and this is red gray. But like I said, I could actually mix these colors if I wanted to, but uh, Michael Harding doesn't uh, make any particular grays, you know, types of grays like these. So I just started using these uh, in the last year, um, mainly as, as convenience. And I have several other convenience colors that I use for, for different um, applications. But uh, since I'm painting two warm light photographs today, uh, my palette is overall, it's going to be fairly warm. Um, this is oxide of chromium, which is the green that I use. Um, this is cobalt blue. This is manganese violet. And this last one here is my ivory black. Uh, put these aside here. I'm using a bunch of different, I'm, I'm going to have a, a couple of different sizes of palette knives here. Um, primarily because I'm, I'm actually going to be using uh, the palette knives to paint with as well as uh, mixing some of the paint that I'm doing. So usually if I'm, if I'm using palette knives uh, in a painting, I want to make sure I have a bunch of different sizes and shapes because, uh, you know, some of them, uh, you, you need a, to have a various shapes and sizes to be able to make certain marks. You know, just having one, you know, everybody has like the one palette knife uh, but it's a good idea to get a bunch of different shapes and sizes. Uh, my brushes here are, these are all made by Rosemary and Company uh, out of England. And Rosemary makes uh, the best brushes around. And I use a, a bunch of different types of brushes um, that she makes. Uh, some of these are, you can see they're, they're pretty well worn, uh, but they last forever. And uh, which is one of the reasons I like them. Um, I use uh, the uh, classic series, which is um, half uh, synthetic and half bristle. Uh, I also use their master series brush, which is series 279. And these are, of course, these are all long handled brushes. Um, so this is their, their, their mongoose replacement type brush. It's a, real, it's a real hair, but it's not actual mongoose. I, think, I believe it's badger hair, but it works uh, almost exactly like the mongoose brushes. Uh, and then I use their, their, some of their hog bristle brushes. And um, we also have a couple of, uh, this one here is a, the Pure Sable, much softer type of brush. And then my other favorite brush that they do is uh, their Evergreen brushes, which are basically like their ivory uh, synthetic line, but they were, um, they're green, but they work differently. Uh, I'm not really sure why, but and you can actually ask uh, Rosemary or Simi, her daughter, why they work differently. Uh, but I know they were made originally, they were just the ivory brushes that were dyed green for Christmas. And she sent them out to a bunch of people and I used them and I was like, wow, these are really cool, but they're different than the ivories. And they started making them regularly. So that's, that's what I'm using here. And then these are the, uh, these are the ivory daggers, which are really cool. Um, they're great for shaping and, and they're great for drawing and kind of, you know, it's got this interesting little angle here up in the top. So it makes it uh, a lot easier to, uh, to, to draw with um, and you can get some really nice sharp lines and then you can turn it on its side and get a thicker line if need be. So, uh, and then of course I'm using Gamsol and then my medium, um, which uh, I've been using, it's, it's a lot of years old, the, the, the jar is quite old, but the medium that I use is made by Michael Harding. 
and it's oil paint medium number one, which is uh, basically linseed tanned oil and double rectified turpentine. Um, it's a very basic medium. Um, it's not stinky. Uh, the, the, well, the turpentine can be a little stinky, but uh, I don't use it for a lot of stuff. I only use it for um, when I need to extend out my paint a little further. But this particular paint, you know, Michael Harding's paint, is is literally just pigment and oil. So you don't really need a lot of medium when you're when you're working with uh, with his paint. So I like I said, I only use it to you know for washes or you know for uh, times when I really need to thin up a color and I don't want to just use the, the typical mineral spirits, um, I will use uh, the painting medium number one. Okay, so uh, this is the subject that I'm going to be working from today. Uh, this will be the, the young lady that I'll be working from. Uh, it's your typical, you know, sort of art school pose. Um, you want to try to get some kind of variation with, uh, you know, a neckline. Um, I may end up changing uh, I'll probably end up changing the shoulder line a little bit, and that's okay to do as long as you have a good understanding of uh, anatomy. Uh, painting is is drawing. So many people over the years when I've been teaching uh, workshops, when I teach classes, so many people over the years will uh, come in and think they know enough about drawing to be able to paint. Uh, that is that is a, a real falsehood, and one of the things that you really need to to do before you pick up a paintbrush is have some sort of understanding of the human figure. And if you're painting portraits, you really need to have an understanding of the human head. Uh, I have a couple other videos, um, well, several other videos that I've made over the years that explain a lot more of that. Um, in this video that we're doing today, I'm going to cover a little bit less about the mechanics of the drawing of the head, getting the accurate, uh, you know, getting the accurate uh, likeness and all that because I've covered that in other videos. So in this one, I want to talk a little bit more about being expressive and how to push some of the angles, you know, how to, to make it a little bit more dynamic. Uh, so that's, that's really what I want to cover. So when I'm looking at uh, this image here of what I'm going to paint, I want to um, make sure that the end product is uh, a little bit you know, better than what's there. That's our job, that's our goal as artists, is that um, we're not here to make a Xerox copy or a facsimile of this. We are here to take this and make it better and make it more exciting, make it more lush, uh, make it more colorful, um, make it prettier to look at. Um, that's why most people have a difficult time when they're in front of a, a beautiful young woman as a model, they have a hard time uh, with it because it's, it's, if, you, if your painting or your drawing doesn't come out as beautiful as the person, then it, it, you'll feel like it's a failure. So I'm gonna, and I'm gonna talk about a few things to, uh, to make sure that we um, enhance the model or we, we can at least stick with keeping that model beautiful. Now the character models, you know, the old men and you know, old men with beards, they're a lot easier, which is a lot why a lot of times, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people have more success painting older men or character looking uh, type models because uh, it's easier to screw up or it's easier to leave something uh, out or over model something or over characterize something because it adds to the character of the painting. Young woman, on the other hand, you need to keep things simple, you need to keep things delicate, you need to keep things elegant, so the neck needs to stay long but not too long, uh, the jaw lines need to be smooth, we need to, you know, to be able to see all these beautiful rhythms that are picked up in the head. We need to, to actually keep those things beautiful and, and sometimes even simplify them even further to maintain the beauty rather than when you're doing a character study, which we'll show you a little later in the video, we can push some things. We can make their noses a little more bulbousy or a little more red, or we can make their beard a little more scraggly uh, in certain areas. Um, that's okay. So, uh, so what I'm gonna do now is, um, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get my drawing brush, which is a lot of times I like to do my drawing brushes uh, 
I like to, to do these things, start with these, these ivory daggers. And this is a quarter inch ivory dagger. What I need to do is get some sort of, uh, some sort of drawing down, some sort of foundation. Um, you gotta look at this like uh, as if you were building a house. And you want to be able to, you have to be able to start with some kind of foundation. You can't just show up to an empty lot with curtains and drapes and wallpaper and expecting to build a house that way. You have to show up with the cement, you got to show up with the two by fours, and that means construction. You have to construct the head uh, with, with your line work, as it were, your wireframe for, for our um, animating crowd, for the people that are learning animation. You have to start with the wireframe. You have to start with the construction uh, to be able to build on top of. But in the, the expressive manner of things, we don't have to be as academic. So, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to push, you know, a few more longer lines. I'm going to look for a lot more um, rhythmical ways of doing things, and uh, so we'll 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 kind of start that way. Now, the canvas um, I've done here, uh, before, before we started rolling here, all I did was I toned the canvas with a little bit of the uh, transparent oxide red and the cobalt blue. And I did a little mixture of that. The idea behind that is I just I wanted to tone the canvas down to about a similar value as this palette I'm working on. This palette is a, a real, um, it's just below a middle gray. And so you want to be able to paint on something that's at least in the same value, uh, in the same value arena as you're mixing. So, because I see what I see a lot of people do is they'll they'll tone their canvases, but they'll have a white palette, or vice versa. They'll 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 have a toned palette, or they'll be working on a wooden palette, and then they're painting on a stark white surface. The problem with that is is what you mix here is not going to look the same here because. Uh, if you're mixing on a middle gray or a dark gray surface or a wood palette and you're putting that same color on a white surface, it's not going to look the same. So, uh, because color and value are, are very relative. So, we need to make sure we have a matching surface uh, in terms of value. Um, so, with that being said, what I want to do is I'm just going to draw a little bit with the same colors that I did the tone with. So just a, you know, and I'm not going to thin it up too much. I, you know, there's enough, there's enough oil in this paint to where I can just use it straight out of the, the tube and I don't have to worry about thinning it down with Gamsol or anything like that because when you thin it down with, with Gamsol or, or odorless mineral spirit, um, you're making it weaker. So, and what it'll also do is the odorless mineral spirit will leach out of your brush and it will pull paint or your pull your tone off your canvas uh, unless you are already using a completely dried surface. The surface hasn't dried completely, but it's, it's, it's dried enough to the point where it won't come off with me rubbing my finger on it. I mean, a little bit will come off, but not much. Okay, so now um, this is about a 20 by 16 canvas, typical size canvas that you show up to a, a, you know, a, a model session with if you're, if you're you know, painting at a workshop or if you're painting at a uh, you're painting at a school or you're painting in an uninstructed scenario. Um, this is a great size to do, uh, you know, a two, three hour study with. So what I want to do is I want to look at what are my, the first, you know, you, you got to look at your subject. You have to sort of study it. And it's important when you're, when you get into a, a, a model situation where there's multiple places around a room to be, or if you're just working one on one, you know, really, really try and see, have a plan, have a focused idea of, of what you're trying to achieve um, here. You know, we want to make sure we achieve uh, the goal of, of having the most elegant possible image of this particular person on the canvas. So this is less of a, a formal portrait. It's not a, a portrait that um, you would necessarily do as a, uh, a, a memory in time of somebody. It could be, but this is more of a, of a moment of a person, not a, a, a portrait that says, uh, this is Jane Doe, and she lived in, um, you know, Birmingham. Uh, you know, this is more of, this is just a, a pretty young woman that I saw, and it was a moment in time that you wanted to capture. So that's, 
that's this type of portrait. You know, there are several other type of portraits, uh, ones I've done on videos before, the, the painting I did of my dad. That was more about the painting of my dad, who he was, and he had direct eye contact with the viewer, and then me as a painter. This is not, this is indirect. This is almost um, a voyeuristic portrait. So, and a lot of times, and I dare, I hate to say this, but a lot of times, these are the type of paintings that sell as portraits versus uh, direct eye contact portraits. Very rarely, uh, they don't sell as well. So what I'm gonna do is just loosely, just kind of loosely figure out the lines of this portrait. You know, this is this, I love this neckline that, that goes down from the back of the head, down the side of her neck. And if you'll notice, the, the shoulders angle this way. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat the shoulders this way because what I'm looking for is uh, I want to see a nice arc here, like a backwards two. I want to come down here, down to the shoulders, and then angle down instead of angling this way. Because right now we have angle, angle, angle. You know, we have all these repetitive angles, which are nice, but then I want to break it up in the shoulder a little bit. So we start off with the big shape of the head, head and shoulders. You know, and we're just, like I said, we're just placing, spacing and placing our shapes. The base of the chin, and from that chin, the neck, the width of the neck. And remember, the elegance of this pose, the elegance of the neck, it's okay to push the, you know, if you, if you want to elongate the neck a little bit, if you're going to make a mistake, make them more elegant. Make them uh, more beautiful, you know. If you're, if you're, if you're, if you're going to make a mistake, make them taller, not shorter. If you're going to make them, uh, if you're going to change their look, change it for the better, okay. You know, for instance, the hair. You know, if you're gonna, if you're if you're gonna make a mistake on the size of the hair, make the hair a little bigger. You know, don't make it smaller, because when you make it smaller, you're changing the skull size, and that won't look right. The hair kind of comes up here, and that has this dramatic swoop down to the back of the head, and then the back of the hair kind of comes down into this the swoop of the jawline and then this side comes down in here and then we'll change the direction a little bit so if this shoulder is like this I kinda wanna see something like that instead she had her shoulder she had her arm up on the uh, the chair of an arm so it was causing her shoulder to come up but I'm going to change that a little bit. I'm going to cheat it. Just don't tell anybody. By the way, uh, if I say any really dumb jokes, it's okay to laugh. My, uh, the late, great Glenn Orbick, who was my drawing teacher, had one of the driest sense of humors you would ever find. And uh, he was fantastically funny. So it's okay to laugh when you... You have to enjoy the process. So I'm not going to really worry too much, I think, about going all the way to the end of these shoulders. What I'm going to do is probably concentrate a little bit more on just the V of, you know, the flesh of her that's being exposed here. So we'll kind of find just a nice way to end this. And I'm not going to worry too much about this area. It's in there, but we can, we can move it around if we want. So this is kind of this shape, this, this positive shape of the flesh here. That's what we're kind of we're going for right now. It's just placed on the canvas. Um, that's kind of our initial block in, the initial big shape, the initial positive light shape. And then against, you know, are we going to make the background dark? You know, I haven't really... Uh, gone into that executive decision yet, but 
as we progress in the painting, it kind of, you kind of have to feel your way through it in an, in an expressive scenario. We're going to kind of let the painting dictate what we do with that. So just kind of rough in where the ear is going to go. I know I'm breaking some rules here about construction, but like I said, I have other videos that follow the rules. This video is, is supposed to be a little bit more about having more fun in the process. Uh, you know, learning and pushing yourself to really try and experiment and, you know, have fun. The main thing is as long as, you know, the, the, the eyes and the nose and the mouth and the ears are in the right place on the head, and as long as your values are correct, uh, you know, who cares what some of your colors, you know, if some of the colors, as long as you have a, a, a warm, light, cool shadow scenario, as long, if, as, long as that, that temperature is working, you know, in the warm light, who cares if you're using orange versus uh, a yellow or, or red versus orange, you know, or in the shadows if you're using green versus blue. You know, as long as the temperatures are there, this is the time to have fun, right? There's a time and place for everything. Uh, you know, if you're doing a formal portrait, you don't want to start with uh, crazy colors like that. But this video is about learning how to have fun and maybe showing off. Find the placement of the nose and placement of the lips. And again, lots of videos out there. Some are done by me on all the mechanics of the head, you know, that kind of thing. So we're going to focus more on having fun with this stuff. Just roughing in the basic planes, the basic planes of the head. Angle of the nose. Now again, painting a pretty woman, you have to stay simple, keep your lines designed. We're designing the head using straights and C curves. That lends itself to the, to the best possible scenario of good design. You know, it's sculptural. So we're going to move along here to the wing of the nose here. And then as I'm looking for my shapes, I'm looking for light and dark shapes right now. I can just fill them in as I, as I move along here. Uh, eye comes down in here, socket comes out, outside of the socket here, the brow bone, and then from behind that, we'll bring in our cheekbone, and look at the distance here. Compare the distance of the shape. This comes down here find this angle back and then while we're working on this we want to make sure we're paying attention to the opposite side of the face so as we build these elements we want to think of the opposite side because you know we all know that that you know the the ideal man uh, drawing that uh, Leonardo da Vinci did the big circle of the guy doing the jumping jacks we've got to we've got to keep that in mind that the human body is symmetrical so we want to keep that symmetry when we're placing these lines now always remember to check yourself so it's like it's kind of like in construction where it's like measure twice cut once measure twice stroke once What's the shape of this cast shadow? Cast shadow is describing the form that it's falling on. This comes up and over. 
trapezius there. As I go to fill in these areas, I'm just going to go in flat. That's what's great about these, these uh, daggers, is that I can get a real sh sharp point if I need to. But then when I want to get flat and fill in a shadow, I just come down on its side like this. And I just kind of plug at it like this. Now again, this is a rough block in. Not a perfect academic block in, but a rough block in. You have to allow yourself to experiment. You have to allow yourself to loosen up every now and again. In my world where I came from, in my art school, everything had to be perfect all the time. Uh, a lot of the folks that come from the atelier schools always had to be perfect all the time. Well, that's a great place to start. When you're, when you're in art school, it's, great, it's a great place to start learning how to be perfect. And then as you progress through your career, when you get out of art school and as you progress through your, your, your education, because you're always going to be learning. Don't ever stop learning. You know, always seeking out new ways of doing things. As you progress through your art career, you need to experiment. You need to figure out your voice. You need to, to figure out who you are as a painter. And that comes with experimenting with different styles, different ways, different methods of painting. You know, if you have a passion to paint like Bouguereau, then, then that's great. You go learn exactly how he painted and, and all the materials and the methods. And there's certainly some great videos on, on, uh, on that. But if you have a desire to paint something different or something else, that's what you go seek out. So what's the simplified big shape here? Now, here's a case where I'm going to use a little medium. It's a very sticky bottle because it's been used for many, many years. Just a little dollop. And that'll, what that'll do is that'll just thin up the paint so I can, it goes a little further because this canvas is pretty textured. So I'm just going to scrub this just to get flat value. Put a little more blue into it if I want in some areas. Because this is, again, this is a warm light painting. This was done under very warm, a warm light scenario. And that tells me that the shadows are going to be relatively cool to what's in the light. So that means my shadows are going to have some amount of blue or green. Or if you're doing a Zorn palette, which I've, I've done videos on before, which is uh, using black as your cool, your black and white as your blue. And I'm going to keep this area soft because it's just going to be where the, the hair and the background kind of merge together. You'll notice the attitude of the pose changes a bit that I've changed the, the direction of the shoulders. Changed it a bit. But that's okay. Keeping my angles simple. Just come in and use what's down there already and just kind of spread that around. Now this is a little bit more of an expressive portrait, so we can go crazy with the background, or we don't have to. We are dictating this. We are the artists. You'll be, you'd be surprised at how many great painters that are painting today and that have painted all through the past, that they have an initial idea or initial plan that they've got in their head, but they experiment as the painting progresses, especially the ones that paint a little more expressionistically 
or paint more impressionistically or looser. They kind of they kind of let the painting progress on its own. You know, there's only so much planning in the beginning that you can do for an impressionistic painting. I mean, you can have a general idea of what you want to see, but there's these things called happy accidents that occur. Fill this in, keep it thin and flat. Because we'll lay color over this after the fact. And let's fix this. And I'm constantly, constantly squinting. Squint, squint for the value. We have either light or shadow in the beginning. So make things that are light, light, and make things that are dark, dark. With half tones and those kind of things come later. Step back, kind of give it a, give it a look. Here we have a cheekbone. And some of these lines that I'm putting in are rhythmical lines that we get from Frank Riley, uh, who was a teacher over at the, uh, the Art Students League in New York. And he trained my teacher's teacher, uh, Fred Fixler, and several other, well, not several, I mean hundreds of other great illustrators. And uh, it was a system of rhythmical and skeletal and muscular rhythms in the head and the figure that we look for. And I just want to make sure that I'm getting things architecturally where they should be. Now, I work differently than a lot of people. You know, there's some more academic methods that are much slower. Uh, there are some methods that work faster. I move at my pace and, you know, there's no race to get things done. Art takes as long as it takes. So we want to make sure that we move at the pace that's good for us. Here, I'm just kind of placing this ear And I'll come back to it when I come in and put the light over the top of it. Again, I'm just getting a basic structure down first. Base of the lips. This is where the, the top plane of the chin meets the under plane of the lower lip. And then here's where the tear duct meets the side of the nose. And then the underplane here of the side of the nose. And then we'll just kind of indicate where the nostril will go. I'm not marrying myself to any specific shapes yet. As long as we put them down simply, we can come back and alter it if need be, but as long as it's in the right place on the canvas, we should be good to go. Corners of the mouth, 
look for a nice rhythm here from the tear duct down to the side of the, the nose and then down curved into the side of the, the mouth. So corners of the mouth here. And we're working on this angle. Look at the angles here. So angled this corner of the mouth, angled down. And it ends right under where the front of the nose is. As I progress along, you'll you'll you will begin to realize that portrait painting is purely almost all drawing. You have to know how to draw the head. Get the angle of the lips right here, and then the lower the lower lip kind of comes in like this. And then, you know, something like this, this cast shadow is a little large. And you know, remove some of these lines here, construction lines, just to clean things up a little bit so I can see the overall drawing again. You know, the, the overall big shape that I'm trying to create. This cheekbone out here. This cast shadow is a little too big. But a lot of this, what I'll do is I'll fix once I start laying on the thicker paint. Where's the base of the, the eyeball here in the socket? Squint. Look for the line of the, you know, in, in images like this where it's uh, somebody looking down, you know, or, or where you're getting a lot of the, the eyelid, you know, look at the direction and the angle of the eyelashes. Get that in, and then it's going to be pretty equal on the other side, you know. So, again, you know, look for ways of tying them in from one side to the other, you know. You're going to see this rhythm like that. But particularly when, when somebody's looking down, especially a woman with the thicker eyelashes, the eyelashes are a very important part of the story, of explaining the direction, the angle, uh, the mood, the character. And we'll just right now we'll just get the darks in of how she's looking down here. And then the lower lid. The lower lid just kind of falls in place here. I'm going to put a little bit of cat orange into this mixture just so it's not too dark. Because I don't want to get too dark in here because the, the eyes are a little bit more sensitive area that we have to deal with. So we'll kind of keep this a little bit lighter. And then this is the, that little remaining light right there is the upper, a light on the upper plane of the lower lid. Okay, so the eye fits in here. And then the actual socket is here. We look for this rhythm here. Comes down and across to the other side. Now, if I was sitting in an uninstructed workshop or whatever, if I was draw painting from the model, <clears throat> I wouldn't get this technical normally. A lot of the stuff I would do is shorthand. Uh, but the idea for the video here is just so you guys can get a real understanding of how important it is to, to know some of this stuff so you can do shorthand. 
you know, maybe some of you don't want to be this technical or want to be this accurate. And that's okay, because it's your art. You don't feel, you know, don't, you don't have to feel like you have to make it look a certain way. Because again, at the end of the day, it's about your work. It's about who you are as an artist, not about somebody else, or not about somebody else that lived in another century. Now, if you're trying to make it look like that, or that's the type of art you want to do, <clears throat> then by all means, knock yourself out. I did spend a lot of my early part of my career losing many countless nights of sleep over why my paintings don't look like John Singer Sargent's. And that headspace is a very interesting place to be in and maddening. It's only for a certain personality. And there are so many great artists that are living today that paint almost as well as the, the artists of the 19th century. And there's so many of them because they have the personality for it. Uh, one of my great friends, Jeremy Lipking, I mean, he's a fantastic painter, and he paints like, you know, so many of the great French naturalists. He's got the personality to be able to sit and paint and make it look perfect. You know, that's, that's, that's how he, he's made up. Some people don't have that ability because they don't have the attention span or... You know, it's all... You know, it, it's all learnable, though. It's just your attention span. It's also about what you want your paintings to look like, your passion, your drive. That's what it's about. Okay, let's get a few more marks on here. I want to stay pretty loose here, so... The iris here, just kind of what shape is that? From here, getting the correct angle down. There's the tear duct here. Here. A lot of times you're going to find that your, your block ins aren't going to be, uh, you know, your block ins are, going to, are not going to be as perfect as you'd like them to be. And if you have a good drawing skill, you know, even some of the great painters will watch videos or demonstrations of some of the great painters who do these block-ins and they don't look like much. Or they'll be like, well, I thought they'd be better than that. Or uh, that's because they're, they're relying on their drawing skill to pull much of the construction and drawing out later in the thicker paint. Because all this is going to get covered anyways. Or a lot of it's going to be covered. So sometimes you save your 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 headspace, your, uh, your energy. Save that for later in the painting when it really is going to matter. Now, if you're doing a, a monochromatic or a pick-out painting, what we call pick-out paintings, where you're just using one color and you're, coming, and you're basically doing a, doing a drawing with one, with one color, then it's a different story. But in this case, this is just a road map for me. This is a road map to where I know where my paint's going to get laid down. And this is where the, the filtrum here is giving us this step. You know, where is the step? where the lower lip passes in front of the upper lip. And when I squint down, this construction is too much. Now where does my neck, where does her neck come out of? It comes out right in here. So I'm going to make sure that this 
This neck is my foundation here. And then the trapezius comes from behind it, like that. But where the shadows are, you'll see in the photo, there's, there's little bits of you know, areas that are a little darker. You're, get, you're getting a little bit of reflected light in through the throat. That's stuff I worry about later, once I get into the thicker paint. When I squint down, it's all shadow. Okay. Squint. How can I make this a little bit more simple? How can I simplify this a little bit more? What can I leave out? It's not about what you put in, it's about what you can leave out. Adjust this angle of this shape a little bit more. And here I like to leave a lot to the last just to make sure everything's lining up. And it's always kind of a fun thing to do for me at the, at the end. How can I get the bottom of this ear to, to relate to that lower jaw? Okay, I think my block in my constructed block in is just about done here. Now again, other artists will take the block ins or the construction a lot further. And they'll have reason to, but for our purposes, this is really all we need at this point. You know, maybe this this comes up here. You know, what does the overall effect look like? I may just keep it floating. I don't know. We'll see. We'll let the painting dictate as we move along. That's the idea of fun, experimental, loose painting. Squint. There's a plane here that cuts down. I want to make sure I get this front plane of the face pretty close. And this comes down into here and over here. As a painter, when you look at your subject, what do you see? A symphony of light and shadow that illuminates a deeper beauty? A complex expression for which there are no words? A minute detail that possesses the entire character of your subject in one glance. If you don't see this, you don't yet know how to read your subject. By learning a new way to see and read your painting's subjects, you'll communicate with a newfound emotional connection to your viewer, making your painting stand out. Join award-winning artist Tony Pro and discover how to unlock the mysterious language your subject hides within. Give your paintings a sense of artistic expression and character. Known for cutting edge realism techniques and winner of the American National Award of Excellence Best of Show at the 14th Annual Oil Painters of America National Show, Tony Pro teaches students all over the world how to read a subject the same way you might learn a new language. Under the quiet and insightful guidance of Mr. Pro, you will start with the basic building blocks of mixing paints and colors. You'll move on to the more complex expressions, such as studying the nuances of light and shadow. You'll then graduate to fluency in expression, facial details, and secondary features, all while blending a solid foundational and formal technique with a romanticism that comes from your own interpretation of your subject's language. When you squint down, if they fall away, if those edges disappear, then make them disappear in the paint with edge. Your paintings will never be the same again. They will take on a new life. 
This four-hour course, which includes a male and a female portrait demonstration, is chock full of insights, tips, and secrets you can't find anywhere else. And it is a skill you can immediately apply to your paintings. Once you've mastered the ability to read your subject, the language will translate to any model or medium, whether you are creating a still life, portrait or landscape, in oils, watercolor, acrylics, pastels, or pencils. Tony Pro's unique history makes him the perfect guy to discover this new way to look at and read your paintings. Built upon the strict academic principles of figure drawing, which Tony mastered under the tutelage of the famous illustrator Glenn Orbick, whose trading he carries on in this course. Now, looking at this, I'm going to make an executive decision and change what I see again. I'm going to take out this and make it all dark. By learning a new way to see and read his subjects, Tony Pro infuses his portraits with his own perspective and emotional connection to the model. Join Tony Pro for Secrets of Expressive Portraits, now available on digital video. Well, that was Tony Pro from the video Expressive Portrait Secrets, and you can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. Remember, in the comments section, there's a special discount code. Look there for it. Thank you for watching.